اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم یا ایوہ الذین آمنوا لا تدخلوا بیوتا غیر بیوتکم حتی تستعنسوا وتسلموا على اہلیہ ذالکم خیر لکم لعلکم تذکرون فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدُوا فِيهَا أَحَدًا فَلَا تَدْخُلُوهَا حَتَّى يُؤْذَنَ لَكُمْ وَإِن قِيلَ لَكُمْ ارْجِعُوا فَرْجِعُوا هُوَ أَزْقَى لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ عَلِيمٌ صدق اللہ العظیم My respected brothers and sisters Today inshallah I'm going to talk about ayahs Surah An-Nur from 27 to 34. There are many important subjects addressed in these ayahs. And before I will go in any detail of these ayahs, I would like to give you a little background so that we can really understand and absorb the meanings of these ayahs. Remember one thing, the injunctions we will see from IR 27 onward in Surah Noor, they deal with preventive measures. That before anything happens, these are the steps that you should take. The ayahs we discussed before, ayahs before 27, those were talking about injunctions about if something happens in Muslim society. And before we go further, I want you to understand there is a, a basic flaw I see in our understanding whenever we approach the understanding of Quran and injunctions and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The basic flaw I see is that we try to compare Islam with other religions and faith and practices and cultures. We have to understand one thing, Islam in itself holds a system. Islam has its own values. Islam has its own injunctions, culture, perspective, approach, mindset. So if we try to uh, mix and match, that's where we get confused. And as you know, there is whenever we accept Islam as a religion, this was a volunteer you know, effort. La ikraha fi deen. There was no compulsion to accept this deen as your deen, as your religion. But once you accept, then you have to accept that the rules regulations, injunctions, values, morals, system, culture, perspective, approach. Islam is going to teach us. Islam is going to guide us. So we should not uh, mix and match. There is another basic problem we have. You know, in fiqh, there, is a, there are two rules. Number one, if your audience are not ready to listen to any of the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they have not reached in their iman to the level that they can really comprehend and understand the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a fiqhi rule that you should hold off. You should not, you know, communicate that ruling. And same thing if there is some saying of you know Prophet or even ayahs of Quran in which you feel like that the, this can cause more confusion among the audience. So let them grow and come to that level that you can really explain all that. Why did I say that? The reason is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu for 13 years in Mecca invested in Sahaba to make sure that they have understood these three basic pillars of Islam. What Tawheed is, if you understand Tawheed, it becomes power and energy. It becomes something that you can hold on. 
and risala if you understand that the prophet sallam is guided by allah subhanahu wa taala from the day he was born up until he departed from this dunya every teaching every saying every step of his life is a noor and roshni and guidance and light for you and me and then we have to invest in ourselves to understand that this life is very little very short and akhara is khairan wa abqa akhara is better and everlasting so these three pillars prophet sallam worked very hard on all the sahaba so that they were ready when they reached to medina for all the commands given by allah subhanahu wa taala that's why hazrat aisha radhi allah taala has said that if the command came in medina would have come in makkah in the initial stages of islam nobody would have listened that very important message for you and me that we have to invest in ourselves to understand the true meaning of tawhid true meaning of the risala of prophet sallam that we have to attach ourselves in love of prophet sallam to know about the life of prophet sallam and then we should know that akhira is our ultimate goal of this life and then this is the scale that i'm going to judge everything i will do in this life whether this is going to benefit me on the day of judgment or not or not the next thing which i will say you know islamic system is a total transformation if you really go through the history you will appreciate that people like michael hart they have not given prophet sallam number 1 rank as the most influential person in the human human history there was a reason for it and the reason was in such a short time what prophet sallam has achieved that was a total transformation of the society inward human development you know islam wants to change somebody from inside his morals his values his ethics his mindset his total approach change which comes inside what you see outside is the reflection of that change and whenever you will read about the hudud of you know allah subhanahu wa taala you have to keep in this in mind that Allah subhanahu wa taala has created many layers and all these layers are the foundation the foundation is that number one that islam wants to develop humans with good character this is the foundation number one the second islam is not a religion which gives you injunctions and rules and regulation and that's it no islam will guide you and me the how we can execute how islam is going to facilitate the execution of those injunctions and those commands so the second layer is that the society at large will facilitate for me to fulfill the demands of allah subhanahu wa taala the commands of allah subhanahu wa taala then you will see the outward reflection then it comes in my dress code how i behave how i deal with people and very end very last pillar of the foundation of the society when it comes to injunctions is hudud and injunctions so these are four pillars they go hand in hand if any one or two of them are weak in any given society then we have to make sure we strengthen the other pillars and you will understand this point as we go inshallah the last thing which before i go to my aya number 1 is that you have to understand that haram and halal they both are obvious evident but there is a gray zone you know that's why it is said you know that every king has its preserve and if you will pasture your animals 
at the boundary of the preserve of that king there is always a possibility that your animals can pass that line drawn by the king gray zone is a zone of doubt and this is the teaching from this hadith you see on the screen that stay away from the gray zone because there is a possibility if you play in gray zone that you may transgress the boundaries of allah subhanahu wa taala you know our dilemma is that whenever it comes for good deeds our approach is that i want to compromise on the minimum that what minimum i can do to fulfill this command of allah subhanahu wa taala but when it comes to worldly things we want to even pass the gray zone but you know the approach of sahaba was other way around hazrat umar says in one of the saying that you should stay away even from the smoke of riba smoke of riba is a gray zone sahaba's approach was that stay away from the gray zone and their approach was they used to come and ask prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam what else can i do to get the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa taala what more i can do in this dunya so my lord my god my rabb will be pleased with me my brothers you know the ayats of surah nur when we will discuss this you will see there is a one basic fabric that we have to understand of these ayats and that fabric is fabric of haya that there will be a reflection of this concept of haya modesty in all the ayats that we are i'm going to discuss today inshallah prophet sallam has said that that every deen religion has an innate core value character and the character of islam is modesty this is the basic fabric of this imara this building of islam is haya and he says what is haya haya is coming from the same root from which hayat is coming the life so that means haya has really the life of our religion this is the lifeline of our religion the teachings there are many definitions given is honor is self respect is bashfulness is decency shyness and uh, basically all these uh, different uh, definitions uh, given and i will just go natural or inherent and shyness and sense of modesty original meaning of haya refers to a, a bad or uneasy feeling accompanied by embarrassment so here is there are some sayings of prophet sallam about the uh, haya i advise you to be shy towards god the exalted in the same way you are shy towards a pious man from your pupil another saying iman has 60 branches and haya is one of one of them now let's take the first aya it basically gives us etiquettes of visiting somebody and i read this aya in the beginning so i have to save time i'm going to just uh, go for translation that oh you who have believed do not enter houses other than your own houses until you ascertain welcome and greet their inhabitants that is best for you perhaps you will be reminded and if you do not find anyone therein do not enter them until permission has been given you and if it is said to you go back then go back it is for for is purer for you and allah is knowing of what you do and this this i am going to skip 
Now, these are the points that I want to talk uh, about this uh, very uh, etiquettes of visitation. You know, remember whatever I have said so far that we have to understand the whole background that there is a transformation going on. There was an incident of if had happened. Surah Hazab has already come. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is has exposed the society, the weaknesses of the society. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing their weaknesses because Islam wants healthy society, focused society, society without any frictions and minimum issues possible. And the pillar of that society is the relationship of Muslims with each other, how they respect each other's privacy, how they interact, what are the boundaries of interaction and socialization. The, you know, this was the culture of Arabs going in, in people's house without permission. They were nosy, you know, no, there were no doors, you know, at the doorstep, there was nobody to stop them. So the basic learning we have from our today's perspective, respect the privacy of a person. And you know, whenever you go to somebody's house, the word here used is tasta anisu. It's not said that if you, if they allow you, actually it's more than just allowing you, their willingness, their consent, they are happy to see you coming in. They are not at un, they are not feeling bothered when the, when you knock at their door. So we have to understand the concept of mind your business. Don't be nosy in pupils' affair. Whenever you go, stand on one side of the door. Don't stand right at front of the door to give the privacy to the house. You call three times when you are at the door and if somebody is asking who is this, then the Hadith of the Prophet says that introduce yourself. Don't say, oh, this is me. Who me? You have to introduce. These are the basic, you know, etiquettes when you go at somebody's door. And follow this even if you are at your own home. If you even, even if you are visiting your father or your mother, you have to somehow alarm them. You have to somehow notify them. You have to somehow tell them you are coming inside. Famous hadith of Prophet in which he says, when some Sahabi asked him, you do not want to see your mom naked. You do not want to see inside, even if your wife is inside the house. The tradition of Prophet of Sahaba was to somehow let the family know that you are coming inside the house. A lot of time I have seen brothers, they call you three times, four times, six times, 10 times, and they should get the message. If they have called three times and somebody is not answering, then let him call you back whenever he will find the time. So knocking at the door or sending somebody a message or calling him on the phone, all these things need privacy of a person. And this is, this is a basic, you know, uh, important concept. Now the second, now is this uh, other subject comes in, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically is asking, Tell bleeding, you know, men to reduce غَدِّ بَثَرْ Lower their gaze. You know, uh, 
Mara Madudi Rahmatullah Alayhi has said, lowering gaze is not really a true reflection of the word Ghadde Basar. Is actually a word. Urdu mein jise kehte nazar churana. Avert your gaze. If you are seeing something that you are not supposed to see, then direct your eyes towards something different. You know, Prophet Prof. say that uh, gaze, you know, is a shatan's arrow. If you will leave it loose, it is going to cause some injury. And as it is said by Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood, Taala, I know that, you know, we do zina, zina of the eyes, zina of our ears, and zina of eyes is that we see something which we are not supposed to see. We enjoy it. That's why in the Hadith says that one glance by accident, no sin. But if the second glance, that is what leaves some impression on your heart. And this is a beginning of a disaster. That's why, you know, when you will listen to the reward, if you if you avert your gaze or you lower your gaze, the reward is great. In one of the hadiths, Prophet says that if somebody sees a beautiful woman and he lowers, averts his gaze, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him sweetness in his ibadah. And what is the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants sweetness in his ibadah? The reason is, brother, your gaze is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whenever you lower or you avert your gaze, basically this is a sign of ikhlas, sincerity, the fear, the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody knows what you are seeing. But this is you who knows what I am seeing, what I am not supposed to see. So whenever you change you lower your gaze, that is a sign that you are thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and because of his command, you are trying to look in a different direction. So that ikhlas, that sincerity brings sweetness in the ibadah. Now the same command, you know, first came for men, the same command then came for for the you know sisters. Wakulil mu'minati ya dudna min absari hinna wa ya fadna furuja hunna wala yudina zina tahunna illa ma zahra minha. See, initial command is the same that you lower your gaze and you guard your private parts. Now guarding private parts includes that you are not naked, includes that the dress you have is not letting your, your private parts, you know, prominent. And you have a dress which is not transparent. It's, you cannot see through, through that dress, your private parts. So you have a dress which shows more decency. But when it comes to our sisters, the command was also to lower the gaze, same way, you know, and also be careful, protect your uh, private parts. But additional command comes, wala yubdina zina tahunna illa ma zahra minha. That sisters are not allowed to show their zina. Adornment. Zina, the definition of zina is anything which can excite, can attract the opposite sex, which can cause opposite sex to have thoughts which are not supposed to be there. It could be dress, it could be your jewelry, it could be the way you walk. 
and you will see that uh, you know in in uh, later on it comes wala yadribna wala yadribna bi khumarihinna ala junubihinna wala yubdina zinatahun this is to you know have your scarf or whatever you have in front of your chest and wala yadribna bi arjulihinna liyuallama ma yuf that when you walk your walk should not you know excite or attract the opposite sex the jewelry you have the walk you have the the sandals you have you know the beauty of when i ever whenever i read this ayah the portion of this ayah that islam even is so carefully commanding our sisters that how you should walk because your walk is also your zina that can also cause you know other sex the opposite sex to be attracted towards you so you know this the beauty of our deen is that allah subhanahu wa taala has guided us to so to such a depth because you know this relationship of opposite sex this really creates a big fitna that's why in one of the hadith parts of some say the weakness of a man is a woman and the weakness of a woman is her children so when we know this is the weakness then we have to make sure in a healthy society that we stop whatever possibly we could so that it, it doesn't cause you know any any fitna in the society and then the last thing and i will conclude that in society the last command comes that you should encourage people to have nikah whoever qualifies by age by means by mental preparation wa ankihul ayama minkum wasalihin min ibadikum wa imaikum that who are among you is ready for nikah then do this unfortunately you know we see not only in western society even if you go in muslim countries doing sin is becoming easier and easier and doing nikah is becoming more and more difficult and i pray to allah subhanahu wa taala that he guides you and me that we really truly understand the spirit of islam the the bottom line message of this deen lot of time what i have seen brothers and sisters that we really do not understand the depth the true spirit of the commands of allah subhanahu wa taala these commands are not to make our life difficult these commands are to make our life easy the reason we see allah's command difficult because we have not invested in ourselves about the understanding of tauhid about the understanding of the risala of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about akhira because allah subhanahu wa taala wants every soul to be successful on that day and if i face any difficulty in this dunya then i know inni zanantu anni mulaqi hisabiya that i know that there is a day coming that i will be in front of my rabbul alamin so i don't mind facing any difficulty in this dunya in fulfilling my responsibility in fulfilling the commands of allah subhanahu wa taala because i know this life of 30 40 50 60 70 70 years you know has no meaning as compared to the life of the waiting period which could be thousand year which could be million year and after the day of judgment there will be a life which will be never ending life and especially in the perspective of the time we are going through right now this corona virus 
he should be able to understand acknowledge appreciate this life is fragile how fragile this life is how unpredictable this life is that this switch of my life could be off any second and i know there will be no second chance for me to come back and rectify and correct my action la aisha illa aish al akhira this was the song of sahaba when they were you know building masjid nabwi and when they were you know uh, building that uh, they were digging that trench at the battle of trench at the battle of khandaq la aisha illa aish al akhira i pray to allah subhanahu wa taala he gives us this true understanding that akhira is khairun wa abqa that akhira is which is better and everlasting for mu'minin inshallah i will close with this inshallah if there is any question i will be more than happy to address if i could uh, inshallah the the first question um you mentioned the importance of being shy towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um however on the one hand we are told that when we are asking of allah when we are supplicating to allah we should not be shy and we should ask allah for all of our needs and have and raise our expectations of him so can you give us a, an explanation for what it means to be shy of allah should we ask of allah freely or you know what, what does shyness mean in front of allah there is a hadith of <laughs> prophet sallam in which a person says that allah deserve you know this haya and shyness from you the most and haya with allah is that you watch your thoughts and you watch what goes in your stomach that is haya from allah subhanahu wa taala that you monitor you filter even your thoughts which go in your brain and also you watch what you eat that is haya it's not haya that you when you are asking anything asking anything is actually recommended by prophet sallam even if you need need you know laces of your shoe you should be asking to allah subhanahu wa taala when we are asking we should ask anything we can but when it comes to our life and monitoring our thoughts and our mind and our actions and what we do instead of having fear of you know father or authorities we should have fear and this fear is the fear of a most respected one not the fear of punishment fear that you love allah subhanahu wa taala that he has showered so many bounties on you the fear you have of your father that i don't want my father i do not want to be little my father i don't want my father to have this feeling that my son has bet basically is letting me down in any ways that fear stops you from doing anything bad that fear of love respect should be in our life when we are thinking and doing or when it comes to our risk jazakallah khair um the next question is regarding the topic of children um and be uh, and weakness so is it a hadith that children are weaknesses of women and women are weaknesses of men is this a hadith and if so what advice is given to try and manage these weaknesses uh, and turn them into positivity yeah i know this portion is hadith that uh, women is a weakness of men but i'm not sure i have to check about the second part but this is basically from human psychology as a physician you know when we deal with psychology we know that for a woman her biggest weakness is her child she can sacrifice everything you know for her child she can sacrifice even her parents her own husband 
because after child that becomes her whole you know life and that's a very natural feeling if the if the woman does not have that feeling no women will be able to you know handle the pain they go through and the patience they need to raise their kids and that is very much needed for for a mother when she is raising her child so but when it comes to men because more you watch your gaze you know important thing is brother that whenever you transgress one boundary of allah subhanahu wa taala there is a possibility there will be next boundary you will transgress because it is like you do if a thief steals something one one time he becomes he becomes more brave next time and if he doesn't get caught the third time he will even be more you know brave than the very first time same way whenever we transgress one boundary that we do we leave our gaze loose there is a possibility that this is going to be the next and the next and the next so for men it is very important wallahi i can tell you one thing if you this is the best parameter if you are losing your focus in your salah if you are losing your khushu in your salah the first thing you should do is to check your gaze and remember the famous story of imam shafi i don't have time to repeat that but brothers if you are careful in following the boundaries of allah subhanahu wa taala especially our gaze of the what we see and these days when we are in front of our screen middle of the night nobody is watching but allah subhanahu wa taala he knows even a little ant which is in a dark night on a dark black mountain hiding underneath jazakum allah khair um on the topic of the current covid-19 virus um can you say a few words about the topic of haya in this context and there are many regulations on whether people should attend gatherings not attend gatherings juma for instance should we follow these guidelines uh, and how should haya be practiced um in the current climate of the climate of the coronavirus jazakallah khairan you know i will say a few things you know as a muslim our approach on this issue should be that we this is a time of our own accountability wallahi is a very serious time we are going through see very few times other than wars it has happened that the door of kaaba is closed right now even people are doing tawaf they cannot even touch kaaba they cannot even go close to the to roda of prophet sallam we cannot even go and attend our regular prayers we cannot go for juma i will be very concerned that is it possible that my lord my rab is angry with me that i have done something in my life that he is taking away all this honor this privilege we have in our life the first thing i will say that we should humble ourselves we should ask forgiveness from allah subhanahu wa taala we should do istighfar we should recall all the mistakes we have done wallahi in these days you know every one of us if we go back and look at our life we have transgressed right and left the boundaries of allah subhanahu wa taala this is you know when it comes to haya that we you know the practice we have now now mashallah we have these scholars they are opening you know all the doors that which transgress all the boundaries of allah subhanahu wa taala and maulana maududi if you read his tafim in in about these ayat he says you know these ulama you know if they are calling themselves muslim and they open the doors 
against the commands of Quran, at least they should call themselves that we are not Muslim. They should disown Islam. So in this time of fitna, when there is so much distraction going on, and most of us, we get caught in the middle of those things, that we should go back to Quran. We should go back to the seerah of Prophet We should go back to our basics. We should go back to our you know, roots. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the past, if I have done any mistake, Ya Rabbul Alameen, I am here. I am your slave. Please do not take away these privileges you have given us. Do not take away the sajda from us. Do not take away this sweetness, this halawa of your salah. I will recommend that we should not only do istighfar, we should do more optional prayers, especially this, this time, you know, tahajjud prayer. We should try to observe some optional fasting. We should ask our little kids to raise hands in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask for forgiveness. This is instead of blaming this country or that country or that person or just talking about what is happening, what is going to happen. And remember one thing, as a Muslim, we should never panic. Yes, we should take our preventive measures, but then we, we trust in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will do my part. If still anything will come on my way, I will take it with a smiling face without showing any panic. And if we show this behavior to our non-Muslim brothers and sisters around us, wallahi, this can become our dawa that these are the people, they are so calm, they are so composed, they are so peaceful. Even whatever is happening, no panic because we believe in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. On the topic of marriage, many parents are struggling to find suitable spouses for their children. What advice do you give for parents to manage this type of situation? And for those parents who perhaps have younger children, what can they be doing now to be better prepared for when this time comes? Two things I will say. One thing is that whenever your child is 18, in my personal opinion, this is what I have done with my three daughters. That once your child is 18 and you can find a spouse for your child, don't delay. They can study, you can still support them, you can still help them out, but let them get married, number one. Number two, I really see a problem in our Muslim families these days, that our social circle is getting restricted, is, is getting narrower and narrower. We are losing connection with our community. I will advise my brothers and my sisters be part of the community. Engage yourself with community. Make sure your kids are social. That's why there is a hadith of Prophet ﷺ. He says, he recommends that marry your child with somebody who is engaged in the welfare of the society, who reaches out to the people to help them out. You know, because of the social media, our isolation, we are cutting off from our community, our society, and our circle of friends. I will recommend that if you really want that your kids can find good spouse, then get involved in community. Be part of the society. Be part of your friends. Make your kids more social. You know, try to restrict their social media. I'm not against social media that this social media is taking away our social skills. And this is what basically is killing most of our families that we, we, have, we have disconnected ourselves with the community. And then when you are disconnected, it's difficult to find the spot. And then I will say that compromise, lower your bar. You know, sister, you know, because I do family counseling as well. 
and we do get you know requests for you know marriages that if sister is coming their bar is very high brother is coming their bar is that if they want stars you know from the sky lower your expectation lower your bar make one thing your decision point see the deen of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if the girl or the boy they are practicing muslim they are social they are connected with the community then rest of the thing will come inshallah on your way jazakallah khair jazakallah khair um perhaps as a follow up to that um the word shy versus the word introvert um, are these the opposite of being social and how do we try to take the positive out of shy the positive out of being introvert and the positive out of being social um for the better good yeah jazakallah yeah i think these are opposite in my personal opinion that you really shy in a sense that you do not want to do anything which is indecent things which can offend somebody which things which can you know belittle somebody things which are obvious that it will put somebody you know in the corner shy away from things which basically make people uncomfortable around you so that's a totally different you know ball game that shyness but the shyness in a sense that you want to stay away from the social circle that you want to isolate yourself you want to you know disconnect with the community that shyness basically is the one which i am discouraging but of course when you go you know among the people then watch the boundaries of allah subhanahu wa taala be careful that you have whatever you are doing is decent in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa taala and whatever is good in eyes of allah subhanahu wa taala will be good in eyes of the people so isolating yourself because of inward personality that is discourage but going outside and showing that shyness basically is a good thing and there was a hadith i can quote here the prophet sallam went was passing by and one brother was basically you know saying some harsh words to his brother that you you should basically go and do this and that why you are shying away from this and that prophet sallam actually said this shyness is the beauty of this person shyness when you are holding discussion with somebody that you show respect you show decency you you show humility you show self respect and the respect of the other person you are not arrogant you are not outgoing in a sense that you humiliate the rights of the other person jazakallah khair jazakallah khair inshallah this will be the last question can you say a few words about what are some of the gray zones with respect to modesty and dress code and specifically there's a question here on this topic about does someone need to wear hijab in front of a gay male and and maybe this question can be asked from the point of view does a man need to wear some additional form of hijab in front of a gay male uh, but the question could also be understood does a woman need to wear hijab in front of a gay male you know hijab basically uh, the interesting thing is that there is a hijab between man and a man and woman and a woman as well so as i said whenever we say hijab the dress dress which which should be proper in a sense that it is covering your body it's not making your private parts obvious it is not see through dress so that applies to both men and women and there are certain parts of the body that even women cannot show to a woman and men cannot show even to a man and also for sisters i will say even 
you know for sisters they are they have a hijab not only from non muslim sisters if if they are they come under this you know screening process that they are they don't have you know well you know uh, i will say they are not they don't have good name in the community muslim or non muslim sisters they have to be careful you know you know exposing themselves in front of those sisters regardless they are muslim or non muslim so my really feeling is that if it's a gay or lesbian or regardless our dress code should be proper in front of all males to male female to female male to female whatever is 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 there's a proper dressing you know code given by islam and what was your first portion of this question brother uh, yeah it was uh, on the topic of gray zones with respect to gray, modest gray dress code zone. what yes. are some examples of gray zones yeah, let me you know a lot of time what i have seen our sisters and our brothers as well no exception that we feel like that covering you know our head is is a hijab you know this haya is that your whole body should not excite and attract the opposite sex so a lot of time i have seen you know when i when when you go in any muslim country you know let alone the western society i have seen sisters that they have you know scarf on their head but they they have tight pant tight shirt their body you know you can see their parts of their body and allah knows best this is basically fails the whole purpose same way i have seen our brothers you know the brothers uh, wearing dress they are coming to masjid going in ruku going in sujood their back is basically showing and a lot of time you know we feel like that i'm strong i'm on social media i can see this because i have you know strong iman but remember one hadith of rasul sallam that mu'min does not put himself in unnecessary trial whenever he puts himself in such a trial that he, then his weakness shows up and then he humiliates himself and this happens in this time and age to all of us that we are on social media we are playing right at the boundary gray zone that oh i can watch or oh, i will stop when the such and such you know scene will come but brothers this is where the gray zone comes and most of us are not strong strong enough to draw a line so that's why it's better for us that close all the avenues which can take us to the sin and from where it's difficult for us to come back especially you know these days in social media we most of us we play in in gray zone when it comes to social media subhanak allahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim wal asr innal insana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu s-salihat wa tawassaw bil haqqi wa tawassaw bis sabr sadaqallahu lazim assalamu alaykum allah